Just about everything you would ever want to know about an electric motor is printed right on the label that's on the side of the motor. In fact, most of the questions I got from part one of this series uh, could be answered by simply being able to read the label. Another question that came up over and over again is, what do you do with all these motors that you've taken out of appliances and such? And that, my friends, is the fun part. So if you hang around to the end, I'll show you some projects that I've done using all different types of motors. One more side note for you here. Uh, this is a very technical topic and there's a good chance that I'll fumble or make a mistake somewhere along the way. If I do, I will definitely add notes to the description and sometimes I try to put notes on the screen like this. So if you hear that sound and you see the note, just pay attention to that and realize that I'm correcting something that I said in the video. Anyway, let's start by reading the label on this guy. I'm gonna throw the label on the screen right here so that you can see what I see. Now, I chose this particular motor because it's got two labels on it. It's got one label based on the NEMA standard, and then it's also got an IEC label right next to it. So it was interesting to be able to see those next to each other. Now, uh, getting into the difference between those two is a little bit outside of the scope of this video, but basically NEMA is what's used in most of North America, and pretty much everyone else uses IEC, which is like being different here, apparently. And that's going to be a theme, as you'll see in just a minute. Now, uh, first thing on the label you'll see is horsepower. Again, most everyone else uses watts or kilowatts. Here in the US, we use horsepower. So HP is for horsepower. This motor is a two horsepower motor. And if you look over at the IEC label, you'll see um, the power rating in kilowatts, which is 1.49, or we'll just say one and a half kilowatts of power. I also explained horsepower more, a little bit more in depth in the previous video, so you'll find out more about that when you watch that one. The next item on the label right across from it is Hertz, which is basically the line frequency coming from the wall. Here in the US, we have 60 Hertz. Many other countries use 50 Hertz, and this motor will run just fine at 50 Hertz. In fact, that's on the label. But as a side note, when the motor, when an induction motor like this is wired to 50 Hertz, as you can see here on the label, it's going to spin slower. Next, we're gonna move on to voltage. Now, this particular motor says uh, it can be wired for 208 to 230, and then you see a slash uh, 460. This motor is basically a dual voltage motor. It can be wired for 240 or 460. If you wanna know more about that, I've got a whole video dedicated to dual voltage motors and even how to figure out the wiring if it doesn't have a label on it. You can click on the link that'll pop up right there. Now, when you see that range like that, where it says 208 to 230, sometimes that's a little confusing for people. Like it might even say 220, sometimes it says 240. It just depends on the manufacturer. Uh, for all practical purposes, just consider all those to be the same. If it says 208 all the way up to 240, just consider that to mean the same thing. Uh, also with lower voltage motors, like you'll see 110, 115, 120, just consider all, all of those to be effectively the same. Okay, right next to that you see PH3. PH stands for phase, and this particular motor is a three-phase motor. Uh, here in the US, we basically have single phase all over the house, and it's pretty rare to have three phase at your home. It's generally only found at industrial sites, although some other countries have three phase at home. Uh, with that being said, it means you can't just wire this guy directly to the wall, at least not here. Uh, you'll need three-phase power in order to run a motor like this. And again, I explained that more in a couple other videos, which you'll find in the description of this video. Next on the list, we've got RPM. In this case, this motor runs at 1,725 RPM, and that's at full load. So when this motor is pumping out two horsepower, it should be running at 1,725 RPM. Uh, when it's idling or when there's no load at all, uh, it might spin slightly faster than that, but it's generally going to be really close to its operating speed. All right, moving down the list, next you see code. Now, code is about inrush current, so let's talk about current first and then we'll come back to uh, code. Uh, next, we've got current or amps. Uh, current is measured in amps. In this particular case, it shows amps of six ranging to 5.8 amps and that's at and that's because the voltage is also given in a range so if you're running at 208 volts 
uh, you're going to be drawing about six amps, and all of this is at full load. So when the motor is fully loaded, it should draw six amps. And as the voltage goes up, you see that the current goes down. And if you double the voltage, you're going to cut the amps in half. That's a topic for a later video, but I just wanted to point out that those two are related. You double the voltage, you cut the amps in half uh, in order for the motor to operate at the same horsepower. Now going back to code, code is a rating of the inrush current. That's telling you how much current the motor will draw at startup. Because when the shaft is not spinning and you hit the motor with full voltage, it's going to draw a lot more electricity than it does when the motor is already spinning or if you slowly ramped up the voltage. So you can look that number up on a chart, but it basically tells you about the inrush current of this motor, what you can expect. Next, we've got service factor, or SF. And service factor, in this case, is 1.15. This is basically the manufacturer telling you how much load this motor can handle above what it's been rated for, and this is only for brief periods of time. So in this case, this motor can handle 115% of two horsepower for short periods of time. But you should keep in mind that that reduces the life of your motor. It's not designed to operate continuously at 115%. SFA is next, and that's basically service factor amps. It's the same thing. It's just showing you how much current the motor will draw if you are using it as full service factor or 15% above two horsepower. Next, we've got FR, which stands for frame or frame size. And in this case, we've got a 56HC. Now, again, that's something you would look up on the chart, but it's a standard measurements which tells you the height from the center of the shaft down to the base. It also describes the bolt pattern down here on the bottom. And if you have a C-face motor like this one, C-face just means that the motor is designed to be mounted by the face. Uh, the frame size will also describe this bolt pattern on the face of the motor. But that's really useful data if you're exchanging one type of motor for a different type, then you can be sure to get the same frame size and it'll fit in the same location. And it's separate from horsepower, so you could get a motor with a little more horsepower but the same frame size and it will bolt and fit in the same location. All right, we're making some progress here. so. We're gonna move on down to AMV, which stands for ambient temperature. And you can see that that's 40C. So this motor was designed to operate um, in an environment up to 40 degrees Celsius. If the temperature is hotter than that, then you should derate the motor because the number one way to damage your motor is with heat. Running it overload, running it in extremely hot environments, that's the number one way you're gonna damage your motor. And so this guy can handle uh, it's full load at up to 40 degrees C, and if you are above that, then you should derate the motor and not run it at full load, or you're going to risk damaging your motor. Insulation class is F3, and that's basically just as it describes. The insulation inside of this motor can handle a certain amount of heat, and if you run the motor above its service factor, or if you run the motor in an environment that's too hot, you can damage the insulation. Insulation class would describe basically how much heat the insulation can handle without breaking down. You damage the insulation, your motor is toast, is done. That's pretty much the most critical part of keeping this guy alive. NEMA design uh, describes the starting torque of the motor, which is different from the operating torque. So you can have two motors with the same running torque at full load, but when they start, one can have more starting torque than others. Now I explained torque in the first video, so I won't get into that here. But if I remember correctly, B is normal starting torque and C is like high starting torque and it's a, it's a scale. That's something that might be useful if you've got a, you know, something that's gonna be starting under a very heavy load, then you might be looking for a motor with a higher starting torque, as opposed to a motor that is spinning a fan, let's say, where the starting torque is very low because it takes very little to get the fan moving and then it needs more torque to operate at the uh, higher speeds as the wind load picks up. So anyway, uh, that's design. Next, we've got time rating. Sometimes it says time rating. Sometimes it says duty cycle. Sometimes it just says duty. All of those mean the same thing. It's a measure of how long this motor is expected to run at full load. So in this particular case, it says 
uh, C-O-N-T, which is for continuous duty. With this motor being rated for continuous duty, what that tells me is I can wire this guy up, run it up to full load, two horsepower in this case, and it will run continuously day and night without any problems. As long as it's not over 40 degrees C and all the other things that reduce the life of the motor, under normal operating conditions, the temperature is right, it's at full load, it will run continuously. That's what that rating means. And this is where manufacturers can manipulate you a little bit because you can have a motor that might have a duty cycle of like five minutes. In fact, I've got another one right here. And I don't remember what the duty cycle is. Let's see. All right, actually it says intermittent duty. Now, this is the uh, lift actuator for the treadmill, which gives you the incline. Now, of course, to run it from completely flat all the way up to incline takes maybe 15, 20 seconds. And then you would normally leave it there for a while. So I would agree that that's intermittent uh, use of the motor. Uh, but what that tells you is it can't run like that continuously for long periods of time or this motor will overheat and be damaged. Again, heat is the enemy here. So the longer you run the motor, the more heat it can generate. Speaking of heat, whenever you use a motor with a variable frequency drive, you got to keep in mind that running the motor slower means that the fan is providing less cooling because it's also spinning slower. That's really important. In fact, you often want to find, if you know you're going to be using a motor with a variable frequency drive, you should buy a motor that's inverter duty. Is That's often what it'll say uh, right on the label. It'll say inverter duty or VFD duty. Now, in my humble opinion, this is an example of the manufacturer bending the rules just a little bit because here it says 2.25 horsepower, but that's a treadmill duty. Now, what is treadmill duty? I have no idea. I tried to look it up briefly, but uh, there's an interesting homework assignment. If somebody can find a measured data, what treadmill duty actually means, uh, post it in the comments. I'd love to see what you guys find. But you should be careful of that, that this motor is not actually... 2.25 continuous, and that's the important thing. Here's another example of a label where you see it says that it's 2.65 horsepower, so that seems impressive, except when you look over here on the other side of the label, you see 1.5 horsepower for continuous duty. So this other horsepower rating is probably just the peak horsepower that it can reach for brief periods of time. All right, next we've got uh, ENC, which stands for enclosure. Uh, this one is TEFC, which stands for totally enclosed uh, fan cooled. And there are all kinds of designations that you'll see there, and you can look those up on the chart. But you can see this motor is totally enclosed. And there's a fan on the back, which maybe you can see that uh, spinning through there as I spin the shaft. Looking over to the right of all those parameters, you'll see the wiring diagram, which tells you which leads need to be joined together in order to wire this guy for both low voltage or 230 in this case, or high voltage, which is 460. And that's basically the label. So what do you do when you have a motor like this that doesn't have a label on it at all, or like this one? Well, the best thing you can do is take your clues from the device or appliance that you took it from. In this case, I got this out of a wood chipper and some of the information was already on the plastic label that was on the wood chipper itself. It said that it was three horsepower. I seriously doubt that that was continuous duty. It was probably uh, intermittent duty of some, some amount. How long do you normally spend chipping? I don't know, but you could take a guess. But anyway, uh, it at least gives you a starting point, right? And then you can use something like this, which is an RPM gauge, a digital tachometer. And I use this guy in order to track the speed. I just stuck a label on the end and spent it around. And uh, after I wired it up to figure out uh, what the operating speed was. And that'll get you in the ballpark. I also know that this is an induction motor. And so it's gonna be wired to AC. I can tell by looking at it. And I have a video dedicated to figuring out how to look at your motor and, and determine what type of motor it is. If you want, you can click on the link that'll pop up and it'll take you to that video. I'll also put it in the description. This motor is a universal motor. And again, in that video, I describe how to figure out what type of motor it is. I took this out of a blender and I know that this guy, uh, that blender was plugged into the wall into AC. 
And using those parameters, you can kind of figure out, uh, you know, how much power you need to supply to it. And then again, using the RPM gauge, you can figure out what its running speed is. And because this is a universal motor, it can be wired for both AC or it can be powered with both AC or DC. One of the areas where that can be tricky is with a dryer, for example. A dryer plugs into a 240 volt outlet because the heating element is wired for 240 volts, but the motor inside might actually be 120 volts. So little things like that you might have to watch out for, but those motors fortunately usually have a label on the side. So you can determine it from that. With that being said, let's talk about some of the projects I've built using these motors. Right behind me, in fact, I've got my bandsaw, which is being powered by a treadmill motor. It's a three-phase motor that I took out of an industrial-sized treadmill. In fact, I've got my smaller bandsaw, which is right here behind me. It's upside down now because this table flips over. And there's a video dedicated both to this table and to that bandsaw build. But that motor right there comes out of a washing machine. And that was way back when I had just a small bandsaw and I upgraded the power uh, with that washing machine motor. It's hilarious. It works great. That was a lot of fun. You should check out that video. I'll put a link in the description for you. Uh, I've made all kinds of power tools. Let's see, I've got my uh, lathe that I built, which is being powered by a treadmill motor. I've also got two wooden clocks. The first clock that I built is actually being powered by the window lift motor from my old van. The cable snapped, but the motor still worked and I decided I was gonna power my clock with it. And so here's a little clip of that first clock. And then I decided I wanted to build a second wooden clock with all the gears being made out of wood. The first one ran a little fast, so I wanted to be sure to use a synchronous motor so that the speed was more precise and therefore the clock kept time more precisely. So that was my second clock. And that was being powered by one of those motors that spins the plate inside of a microwave. If you want to just look through my YouTube channel, I've got a whole bunch of videos of all types of projects that I've done with motors like this. And hopefully that'll inspire you to make some new things as well. In fact, I've got two more projects coming up using salvaged motors. I won't tell you what I'm building yet, but they are epic. And if you want to know, if you want to be notified when those videos come out, you should hit the subscribe button, but you should also click the little bell because that actually sends a notification to you to let you know that I've posted a new video. There's probably gonna be one more video in this series because I wanna take a few motors apart and show you some troubleshooting stuff, if some basic things if you're having problems with your motors and also give you a chance to look at the guts on the inside. Anyway, until then, thanks for watching.